I've been involved in um, looking at the profession, been involved in the ISP since uh, probably about 2008. I chaired the um, corporate reps uh, and, the cor uh, and drove the corporate agenda for the Institute um, until uh, back end of last year. Um, I think it's really interesting how organisations uh, are tackling uh, the skill shortage um, today. What I thought I'd do is run a little bit, uh, run through some of the trends that we're currently seeing in the diversification of the skill sets, um, largely driven by some great work that Pete did as we've looked at refreshing the ISP skills framework, um, and then look at what are companies and organisations doing to uh, address the skills gap. Um, so in terms of the evolution of skills, I tend to think of it as uh, living on a spectrum. At one end you've got the deeply technical competencies, at the far end, at the opposite end you've got um, the business aligned, business orientated lens. I think probably if we looked back 10 years or so, most of us were probably somewhere on the middle of this spectrum. So we all did a bit of everything. Um, we probably did a bit of policy work, we did a bit of firewalls, we might have done a bit of ops, um, throw in some antivirus. Um, things have changed. Um, so the first thing I observe as I look probably over the last three for the more mature organisations, maybe even five years, is what I would describe as the dash towards the boardroom. So for those of us at the more senior end of the spectrum, um, as cyber security uh, elevated itself as a topic into the consciousness of senior leaders, both in government and in business, um, what we saw was the heads of IT security were elevated within their organisations, um, were increasingly being asked into the boardroom uh, for their opinion. Um, and uh, I know uh, one of my... Uh, colleagues jokes that he spent 11 years trying to get into the boardroom and he spent the last three trying to get out. Um, but I think what's interesting from a skills perspective is that changes the level of professionalism you need to operate at. And it's a new set of skills. So it's not about being this generalist. It's about being a highly competent, professional, business orientated communicator. So CISOs today now need to be um, commercially aware. They need to have a proven record of delivery. There is a very big spotlight of expectation that will land on you as soon as you walk in the boardroom. You need to be, have strong leadership skills, sound decision making. Um, if you look at um, where CISOs are now reporting, um, Two-thirds of CISOs report to a C-suite executive, somebody with a C in their title, be it CFO, CEO, CIO. A third of CISOs uh, now report to a C-level executive who's outside of the IT function. Now, that's a huge shift. And increasingly, we're seeing CISOs now reporting directly into CEOs. Um, One-fifth of those surveyed recently have a direct reporting line to a CEO. <coughs> very different reporting line, very different set of skills needed at that level. However, and here's the interesting thing, at the other end of the spectrum, the bad guys were getting really good at what they do. So the, the sophistication of the threats increased, which means many organisations have had to build deep technical expertise over the last few years. Your generalists in the middle were not technically savvy enough to actually be fending off the bad guys. So we've seen uh, a growing demand for more deep technical expertise, both in terms of system development, in terms of system assurance, in terms of incident identification, um, intrusion detection, um, digital forensics and response. Um, and if you look at the skill sets that are actually being sought after in the market, half of the companies surveyed um, are trying to recruit security architects at the moment. 
Security architecture is the most sought after skill set currently in the UK job market. So we're seeing this diversification of skill set, which makes life really complicated for organisations that have to grow uh, this diversification. To add a little more complexity to the picture, we're also seeing the introduction of new sub-disciplines. So we're seeing uh, cyber intelligence analytics, we're seeing uh, human factors, behavioural change and psychology coming into the profession, and we're seeing big data analytics for security purposes. So it is a fascinating evolution of the skills necessary. Um, a curious thing, if you read the, Barclay, the latest Barclay Simpson report, um, there's a, a sentence in there that says something along the lines of um, that there is a really large demand for people with good currency in skills, but strangely enough, there's a number of people in security who are originally in that centre space um, who are getting increasingly difficult to place. So there is a real need for both individuals and organisations to ensure currency of skill set and that people are uh, playing to these, these new skills. Um, so we can't go through a, a topic about growing, managing talent without a conversation around the skills gap. Um, so ISC squared uh, did a piece of research and they are estimating that by 2020 globally there will be a shortfall of some one and a half million people. That's a huge number and 2020 is actually not that far away. So that is certainly cause for concern whether it indeed is truly one and a half million or whether it's one million or whether it's two million. I don't really care about the number but it's certainly the direction of travel that's important. Today, six out of ten organisations cannot recruit as many security staff as they would like. And yet, really interestingly, if we look at the demographic of the profession, actually, we're quite mature. Um, so only 7% of people are under the age of 30 within the profession. So we kind of got to do more to encourage new blood uh, and the next generation in. Interestingly enough, if we look at the gender split, as was previously mentioned, um, it's about the same figure. It's about 7% women, um, which is clearly something that we need to seek to address because if we need to grow by the numbers that we need to grow, we need to do that across as big a diverse talent pool as we possibly can. Um, and, you know, an often uh, cited quote from the National Audit Office is they believe it might take 20 years to address the skills gap. So, where are a lot of companies today? So, <laughs> most employers want experience. <coughs> most new starters who are trying to enter the profession are struggling to get that experience because employers are just looking for the experienced hires. A lot of employers haven't got the time to develop people who are coming straight in with little experience at the beginning. Um, either in terms of absolute time or in terms of the infrastructure needed to take on raw talent and grow that <coughs> talent. Um, we're all getting increasingly busy. Um, in a world of too few people, people get busy. Busy people burn out, pe busy people leave. Um, that therefore means there are fewer people. Um, if you train people, um, it's a hot jobs market out there. So salary uh, growth is running at about 7%, if you believe uh, some of the salary surveys that are, sorry, 17%. Um, so train them, uh, they're likely to head off to a, a new employer with the new skills you've just given them. Don't train them, they're probably likely to leave because there's no development opportunity uh, and you know, people have aspirations of um, and growing in their career. Really tricky, thorny problems. What are the um, uh, mature organisations doing? Well, actually, we need to train people. We need to grow people. We need to get new raw talent into organisations, and we need to grow them. 
So um, a number of organizations are moving from a place of we only want experienced hires, they're moving down to recruiting graduates, and uh, as and things, initiatives such as the National Cyber Apprenticeship Schemes begin to kick in, we're also seeing a large number of employers looking to bring in raw talent directly from school uh, in a structured way. So there's some good initiatives out there about introducing um, new talent into the profession. Um, let me turn my attention uh, quickly to what m many companies are doing, and we'll ha I'll hand over to John in a second to talk about uh, what Lloyd's Banking Group have done. How do you promote talent within your own company? So um, the ISP skills framework um, is uh, a tool that many companies are picking up and running with. Um, for those of you not familiar, uh, the skills framework is a uh, set of about 35 different competencies grouped into uh, 10 topic areas that you see there. Um, it has in the UK become the de facto standard for how you measure the competency of a cyber security or information security professional. Um, we've just refreshed it. Um, uh, Pete's done some sterling work. Um, and uh, the great news is, yes, we've seen some new skills uh, being introduced into the framework, but actually, about 85% of it is probably as it was 10 years ago. So it's more of evolution than revolution, um, which I think is probably testament to the people who uh, wrote the uh, 2010 version. Um, so what is a uh, information security profession in a, a corporate context? So um, this is uh, one example. And it's probably the best way of, of painting a profession on a single slide that I've, that I've seen. Um, so this company uh, decided to look at all the different activities that their uh, security team did. There was 87 people in their security team at the time. Um, when they looked at uh, the various roles uh, that the individuals performed, they realized actually those 87 people basically did one of 20, 21 different roles. And you could group those roles into four different families with different levels of experience or seniority uh, as you went up the chart. Really good thing about this is a line manager can sit down with an individual and say, where do you want to be in five years? You know, you're here today. Where do you want to be five years from now? And so the individual can say, ah, oh, actually, I'd quite like to do that. Or I'd quite like to do that or 10 years from now, I'd like to be there. And so if you can then map the ISP skills framework and the various skills and competencies onto each of these roles, it becomes really easy to get into a conversation of, OK, you're here today and you can do these things. You want to be there tomorrow. Ah, you've got some gaps in your skills and capabilities that you need to fill. Um, so. Um, what is a really simple picture becomes a really useful tool between a line manager and the employee that then leads to uh, a clear action plan around development opportunities and learning opportunities for the individual. Um, over the last uh, few months, uh, the corporate reps team has been working, um, looking at a process that companies can use to adopt and build uh, their own internal um, information security professions. What we typically see is companies kind of want to put their own corporate color, be it green or blue or orange, um, on, uh, uh, on the profession that they create. So they will typically take the ISP's skills framework and then adapt it slightly so that it fits in with all of the other professions that they may have uh, within their uh, learning and development team. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to John. Um, and John will talk a little bit about the experience that Lloyd's Banking Group have had and how they've taken this concept and, and implemented.